Yeah, we are live, uh, Sindur. Excellent. Welcome to DocSpot Facebook Live. Thank uh, you. We will just, yeah, you're welcome. We will just wait for some people to join in because Facebook takes some time to inform everybody and people while they join, it takes a little while. Okay. okay. So uh, we were talking about Shirwal, right? And, yeah, just very uh, interesting. Dog. Yeah, when you said that you start calling all the dogs with different names, there was there is actually a case study on a band called Jetropal. Uh -huh. And uh, they ac they actually used to call themselves with a different name every time they used to go for a jamming session in every pub. So they said, we'll <laughs> keep the name when we got, uh, you know, called again with the same name. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, so the chances the of getting name. called is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a brand branding case study. That's we have some people yeah. jo joining in. So we have... Okay. Uh, hi, Ruhi. Hi, Ravi. Sandeep is there. Sushmita Datta is there. Hello. We are waiting for some more people to join in. And uh, are you guys able to hear us well? Ruhi, can you hear us? Hi, Suchi. Suchi is my student. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we have uh, almost 100 people. Right. Hello, people. We uh, This is uh, Rana Thaya from uh, DocSpot. I'm the founder of DocSpot.in. And I have Sindur with me to me today. Sindur with me today. Uh, Sindur is a, uh, I know Sindur since a very long time. I think 2009, I and Sindur actually left our corporate jobs uh, at the same time. Uh, in 2009, we were actually discussing about it. And there is another uh, common thing between us that we both come from internet digital background. She used to work for Yahoo. And uh, I have worked for IndiaTimes.com, uh, iVivo.com. And then I was taking care of social media at Aircell. Uh, and I have been a product manager myself uh, in these internet companies. And I think, Sindur, you were also in a product management profile, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so when when actually Sindur joined uh, Pet Industry as a full timer, I was very happy. I was like, I started thinking, I think I did something right. And now we have somebody <laughs> <laughs> from the similar background joining Pet Industry. And uh, so we have a validation. And uh, <laughs> so that was very interesting. Uh, Sindur now, uh, uh, she is the principal and founder of Bath. Uh, it is uh, based out of uh, Bangalore, and uh, they. Uh, so Sindur is going to tell us more about uh, Bark. Sindur, over to you. Please uh, tell what is Bark all about. Sure. Uh, so I think I should not say it's based out of Bangalore anymore. I think it's based out of the internet <laughs> because we're <laughs> completely <laughs> online enabled. So our location is really irrelevant uh, at this point, and I'm glad. Uh, so uh, Bark is uh, a, a school where we teach. Um, <clears throat> we offer courses uh, for both pet parents and professionals on canine behavior and ethology. Uh, uh, so just to uh, clarify what that is, um, canine behavior is where we look at uh, the behavior of an animal and understand where that's coming from. Whereas canine ethology is studying the behavior, uh, behaviors that are natural to free ranging, free willed animals. So one is to be able to see uh, if, for example, if you were to look at wild animals, uh, studying of the wild animals in a lab uh, is a behavioral study. Uh, but uh, if you actually go out to the jungle and stay in the forest and do a study of what they behave like in that environment, that's an ethological study. And given that we are in India, we get access to free willed free ranging dogs. So that's what we do. Um, and we offer courses, uh, small workshops for pet parents, as well as a nice long uh, diploma uh, for, uh, for people who want to be professionals as behavior consultants. And I think we'll come back and talk about it towards the uh, uh, end of this talk. Yeah. But that's what we do yeah. at Bucks. Yeah, so people, we are going to talk more about uh, what uh, all courses uh, Bucks offer. Uh, and uh, like Sindhu said, wherever you are in the world, you can do those courses because they are now more internet based. 
uh, than earlier they were more uh, class based i think there will be some class based courses uh, maybe in future uh, once we are over this time right lur uh, that's what we all you feel know i reached a point where i do not want to speculate on the future at this point <laughs> uh, we'll keep our hopes up all right we'll keep our hopes up uh, but right. uh, as of now we're happy to say that we have students from 15 different cities in india and eight different countries across the world so you know that footprint i think that kind of diversity of thought uh, is something i value a lot and so i don't want to lose that so i think our students also and me personally we benefit a lot from that kind of diversity um so yeah that's that's the exciting part cool so uh, sindur uh, while we were talking uh, you actually mentioned about uh, my, uh, myotherapy right and uh, right. it is more about pain management uh, what is myotherapy i mean how do you define it All right. Uh, so uh, I am um, uh, qualified as a, a canine myotherapist from Garland, UK. Um, so what myotherapy is is you can think of it like sports massage. If any of you have had sports medicine treatments, uh, sports massage, uh, you know what exactly what it is. And if you have had sports medicine, you know it's one of those. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those really painful massages. So that's how I describe sports massage. It's you come back. looking like you have been abused you know battered and blue uh, right. uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be that way actually uh, that's something interesting i learned so that's what uh, myotherapy is uh, to put it technically it involves um uh, manipulative hands on ther- uh, therapy and what that means in english is it's massage uh but it's deep tissue massage being aware of you know where the issues are and then passive movement and passive exercises uh and there are a lot of people who provide this uh i think what garland myotherapy is distinctly different from the rest of these treatments is we do what is called choice led uh where the interestingly the dog turns around and tells us hey this is what i need uh and the reason i mentioned that um painful sports medicine i've had it so i know how painful it is um is yes, that uh, when when we when i was doing my practicals with julia uh, the the first session was when they were doing the techniques on us and i was screaming i was like oh this hurts and i turned it on and i told her wait you plan to do this on dogs you do remember they have teeth right <laughs> and i've seen that they don't they don't use muzzles they don't tie the dog up they don't put the dog on a table so i said you're going to have a dog your face is going to be inches from your neck is going to be inches from their face and you're going to be doing this to them and a lot of the dogs that i've dealt with that have pain issues you know that they can turn into biters simply because of the pain issue and you're going to be mm, doing yeah. such a painful treatment on them and she said uh, No, no, not only are we going to do it, they're going to ask for it. Wait and watch, and that was fascinating. And that's kind of what we do, which is choice led. The dog actually turns around and tells us, "Do this, do this. This is what I think is the right exercise for me. This is what I think is the right movement for me." <clears throat> so that's distinctly what uh, Garland myotherapy is all about. And I believe you're going to be having a longer conversation about it as well uh, later. Yeah. I think next, early next month. So. It's fascinating thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, guys, uh, we are going to have Julia from Garland speaking more about myotherapy, uh, uh, and we are going to touch touch about uh, it briefly with Sindhu today. So, Sindhu, does it work as a cure or as a prevention, or does it work both ways? Okay. So, let's uh, look at where it is used, right? Especially in India, uh, we use it on dogs that have issues like hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, arthritis, patellar subluxation, spondylosis, you know, injuries, trauma and things like that. Uh and the truth is none of these conditions are curable. Right? The conditions by themselves are degenerative conditions. So there's nothing you can do about them uh in terms of reversing it. uh but what we do in myotherapy is managing it because the big issue with most of these conditions is so let's say that you've kind of torn your muscle now even a muscle tear it may heal it may form scar on it but that scar tissue is not the original tissue which means that it's never going to go back to where it actually was and what does that mean when we say scar tissue is not the original tissue it uh, is a tissue that has less elasticity so that entire muscle moves differently it uh, behaves differently uh so uh, 
what is the big challenge so i when i was dancing in my younger days back in 2009 actually uh, i uh, tore a muscle on my right leg and interestingly today uh, it's my left leg that's in immense amount of pain and you can guess okay. why right because subconsciously because somewhere i've been overloading on the left leg right left. now that's where myotherapy comes in which is to say okay so you're going to have compensatory issues you're going to have compensatory movement the body automatically tries to protect these injuries but in the process of protecting it don't injure more of what is remaining so how do we provide relief in the compensatory area and how do we retrain your brain to balance load a little bit better um you know those kind of things so it's really about uh, you know a, a dance teacher once told me i was cribbing about i'm injured here i'm injured there and she said Listen. After a certain point, we're all injured everywhere. It's about figuring out how to move comfortably, accounting for our injuries, and that's really what myotherapy tries to do: is to figure out how to improve your quality of life, given the injuries that we, the dog, sustain. Right. So, uh, does it also, you know, brings you to a level after being in uh, studying of uh, animal pain management kind of a stuff that you can look at an animal and tell that this dog is showing some kind of a lameness very early yeah, stage or absolutely and this is this is where myotherapy is actually different you know canine myotherapy is different from human physiotherapy because a human physiotherapy walks in and they they they're happy to point out where their pain is right human beings we whine and crib a lot we don't need to be asked twice oh i have yeah. pain here i have pain here and i can talk about it for hours dogs on the other hand like most animals um they are very stoic they do, they tend to hide their pain um uh, and so we have to guess uh, so they're not going to turn around and say okay i have a boo boo here that's not what's going to happen however what we do know is if they have a pain here what are they going to do they're going to overload on the other side a little bit more right so when they overload on the other side how will that look for you physically so for example their front paws if they're if they're having pain here then this paw might be slightly rotated and out because they're overloading on that side right uh, so see, i'm i'm i'm, I'm struggling with the reflection okay so if they have pain here this is what they're overloading on and they will shift their weight and you will see that the slight shift and the paw is slightly rotated out or if you observe their nails for example these nails on the outside of one leg may actually be worn off more than these what does that tell you that means they're actually walking a little bit like that with the pronation so those kind of things we look at how do they climb the stairs how do they sit down and get up where is the drive coming from what does a square dog look like and where is this different so <clears throat> some are very easy for all of us to spot you know your classic labrador bum shaking that often times tells you that there is a instability in the hip uh, some are really simple like uh, if they're not able to poop one shot poop a little get up move poop a little get up move you know we call it installment pooping then we know they're not able to hold that position so these are easier but a little bit more complex we can do in terms of watching you know we usually uh, look at dogs from the top the sides the back and the front standing and walking and sitting and then see where the differences are and say okay why are you why why is your weight seem to be shifting one way or the other why is the knee not bending enough why are you having that sway in the hips and that's how we can kind of arrive at the conclusions many times you know in one of the sessions i attended uh, uh, with you uh, i mean you you were uh, actually you did a workshop i think and i attended that workshop and you were actually talking about obesity uh, also gets linked to lot of pains wherein you know we keep treating uh, our dogs with obesity <coughs> but it is actually uh, the the back it might have got some pain in the hind uh, quarters and then it is giving lot of uh, load on the shoulders on and the, the shoulders will be heavy right yeah yeah so, so that's what we call compensatory issue right so you we talking about you're talking about two different things actually so okay. obesity let's and let's talk about obesity for a second uh, uh, we you know when julia was here uh, in india we did this exercise where she asked us to carry uh, about 3 kg of sugar and walk around and sit and get up and uh, she was like see how it feels uh, so if you're carrying extra weight on your body 
the muscles, the joints that are already overloaded, you're kind of overloading them, right? So it's already pain coming from there. So, you, you know, all the issues that come from a joint issue are going to be compounded and more if you're overweight. So one of the first things that we do with dogs when we realize they have joint issues is to say drop the weight. Drop the weight to as much as you can because the lighter you are, the less load on those joints, the quality of life improves. The other issue that you're talking about, which is compensatory, which is if I have an issue on the back, if I'm moving my weight to the front, then that's not actually so much obesity. It's actually muscle overdevelopment. So it's not fat that collects on the front. The muscles itself start getting thicker because you're overusing the muscles. So if you see Nishi's pictures from about a year ago, uh, because she her hind legs have so much, uh, so many issues, she's been overloading on the front. So her neck is this thick and her front shoulders are this thick because those muscles, it's like uh, doing going to the gym and working out only one set of muscles and not the other. So she's become butch on one side and not so much on the other. Uh, what we would like to see with dogs and boxers in general have a sort of tendency to lean forward, but the muscle development has to be balanced so if you see an imbalance where the hind legs are hardly any muscles they're very thin and the front muscles look like fat and butch like they've been working out then i know that there's clearly a compensatory issue there mm -hmm. and for some Got reason it. the neck also in, uh, you know um, gets very very fat in the case of dogs because like julia says unlike us the dogs walk on their neck the neck is connected to their front legs so you know mobility yeah. issues transfer to the neck in dogs a lot more than in us so that's really where yeah. a lot of the discomfort comes from. So that actually also reminds me of um, my engineering days, wherein you know when we used to study um, mechanical engineering course, yes. and then they used to talk about the truss and how mm -hmm. uh, how to balance a truss, and uh, yes. and that is you know what fascinates me about dogs that they are actually more complex because they actually walk on four legs. And then yeah. there is a spine which connects, and then there are all these elements that what is uh, what angle and how can they walk better, and why they might be facing some kind of a pain or imbalance or uh, things yeah. like those. So uh, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually this field, yeah. biomechanics is very interesting. And if you look at Julia's book, she has a picture of a bridge there that talks about load and how you know if one leg takes less load, how it overloads the others. And frequently she would tell me when I was saying when I was asking her for help, she would be like, "This is just plain simple engineering, Sindur." You know, she would keep repeating that to me, and that that really sunk in because yes, at the end of the day, it is physics and engineering. That's why we call yes. it biomechanics, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, you actually mentioned how do we, how, how do you guys do these studies, right? That you actually were talking about that you put cameras and the probes. And can you explain a little bit to our viewers? Uh, okay, so that's not us because we don't have the money to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, so, but you, you um, where you studied, you you actually you have exposure of seeing that how to. Uh, we, that that was system. actually uh, Professor Martin Fisher in Germany, and I attended a talk by him. So they, what they do is uh, they have these extreme machines uh, that are not not like still X-ray but moving X-ray. So those kind of machines cost an arm and a leg. So you have to be in a European country to do that. <laughs> to do that. Uh, okay. uh, but right. to see how you know uh, the leg moves, uh, how the muscles move. Um, so one of the really, really interesting things that, you know, and this is a little tidbit, you know, for those of you who can, who are excited about this, uh, I think this will, this will really uh, get you excited. So in a dog's case, right, and I always have this dog sitting here. Uh, so in a dog's case, they have this shoulder blade that sits right on top here. Uh, so our shoulder blade sits back here, you can feel it. Uh, and in our case, the shoulder blade is connected to the front arm and the collarbone here. In a dog's case, interestingly, that shoulder blade is not connected on one side. It's connected to right. the front leg, but it's not connected right. on the other side. And the reason right. is because when dogs move, that movement is coming from up here. That shoulder blade actually glides up and down the neck and, uh, you know, the rib cage, uh, rib cage yeah. giving them that, that, you know, wonderful sense of movement, that fluidity. Uh, mm. So that was kind of what the, uh, the the work with the machines that they were doing. Uh, what Julia, uh, the studies that they're doing on movement, and of course she will talk a lot more about it, uh, is to do with more of uh, measuring um, 
uh, the muscles, the, the relationship between the muscles on the neck and the leg, and also relating it back to uh, what we call the comfort score. So we deal with it less from a theoretical perspective and more from improving welfare of pet dogs, right? Because at the end of the day, my interest is what do my clients want? They don't want to know whether, you know, hey, where is the shoulder blade located and what is the anatomy of the dog? What do they want to know? Is my dog happy? So Julia works with what we call the comfort score to see, you know, what is the quality of life of your dog? And is there a correlation between the muscle sizes and uh, the comfort score? And can we kind of move them along the line to get them to be more comfortable? Uh, so that's kind of where we come from. So it's really fascinating that you can come at this with so many different angles. Uh, it's not just, uh, you know, movement alone. Yeah. And what type of... Uh cures can be done using myotherapy like you know is it uh, good for arthritis can you name a few areas uh, where, yeah so uh, this, this um, pretty much uh, again it's not cure it's uh, it's uh, improving comfort uh, so improving it's about comfort, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> because remember arthritis none, none of these are actually curable when with arthritis there are supposed to be some injections that can be used but they're very, very uh, hard to come by, very expensive, very painful. They're used for resources um, to increase the synovial fluid, the fluid, right, in the joints. So there are injections, yeah. but I don't think that's uh, being done for dogs. So it's 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 at the end of the day a degenerative condition. All of these are. Uh, so we only look at improving comfort for the dog, given what we have. Uh, pretty much like ourselves, right? Rana, you were talking about we've hit a certain age where we all have these pain issues. There's nothing we can do about it, yeah. okay? So yeah. we, <laughs> we only try to figure out how to be comfortable and functional from here on. So it's functional movement and comfort level. Uh, so look, uh, we can deal with uh, dogs with arthritis, dogs with hip dysplasia, dogs with uh, patellar subluxation in the knees. Um, elbow dysplasia is also something that dogs have uh, spondylitis and spondylosis, uh, um, bone spurs in the in the uh, spinal column, in the vertebrae, um, injuries if you have a three-legged dog or even if you have any injury, any uh, muscular injury, muscle wear and tear, uh, these uh, are all conditions that um, will translate into, uh, you know, these are degenerative. If you don't address it, the quality of life keeps dropping. Having said that, with many of our pet dogs, they do have muscle tears, muscle uh, ligament tears and things like that, that we are not even aware of. So I told you, mm. you know, um, almost 10 years ago, I was dancing and I tore a muscle. And at that time, I rested for a bit and I continued dancing and running and all that crazy stuff. Um, and uh, only now, 10 years later, I'm realizing, oh, that story didn't end there. That story had another chapter and that is open now. <laughs> so uh, with, our, <laughs> with our dogs, uh, you know, look at the tiles that we have, right? Uh, on these tiles, yeah. if they're running, they're skidding all over the place. And dogs walk on their tiptoes. They don't plant their full leg. You know, they, they're kind of on their yeah. tiptoes. So it's like running on, on, with stilettos on these floors. Uh, they're going to be tearing muscles. They're not going to give you a hint that they've torn the muscle. But 10 years down the line, they've been overloading on other legs. And so they may have onset of arthritis 10 years down the line because they had a bad game of fetch that they played 10 years ago. So you see right. how that story adds up, right? So it's also yeah. preventive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's also preventive so, to do lifestyle management early on so that we don't have these issues. Or even if we do, we are constantly sort of shifting load back and constantly sort of dealing with the uh, compensatory issues. Yeah. So do you also guide people and help them to improve the lives of their pets while they are in their homes? Like, you know, telling them how to put a carpet and there might yeah. be multiple things. One of the things was, which I actually learned from you, is that how getting a dog in and out of car can be very injurious to them. Yeah. When you see yeah. it in slow motion. So can you touch yeah. upon a few of those things? Yeah. Yes, those slow motion videos are disturbing, aren't they? Especially once you yeah, start cleaning are. the, oh yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, we do that. Uh, and that's that's one of the things we do with a short uh, workshop that we have. It's focused on lifestyle. So though we call ourselves a behavior school, the behavior is uh, only, uh, it, it's, it's a product of coming from within the body. So 
for us as uh, be, you know behavior consultants if the body is broken you can't expect some kind of a great behavior if you are waking up with a headache or a shoulder ache every day i can't expect you to be bright and chirpy right so uh, we have to come from a holistic perspective on this so one of the things that i uh, we do focus on is to look at all aspects of this to say lifestyle issues for example if you're going to have um, a sofa like this and your dog is going to be climbing up and down uh, again like you said that slow motion video of the dog jumping off and on yeah. the flooring that's a bad idea so what can we do um my dogs don't climb on this sofa but if they were then i would probably put a really thick carpet right under it to cushion that mm -hmm. jump right, right. Uh, or uh, if you look at my room here we have like carpets all over the place so putting these island carpets everywhere um so these kind of lifestyle changes uh, lifestyle changes in terms of what kind of equipment that we use for them when they're walking because the neck again i told you is they walk on their necks it's a very 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 vulnerable part of the body um uh, then what kind of diet would we like to get the dog on in terms of does the dog need weight management does the dog need stress management so it's a very very holistic thing and we do cover all of it and you can't when somebody comes to me and says my dog has a behavioral problem the first thing i look at is okay let's park your problem aside let's go and look at the dog and the entire life because i need a better insight into what is causing it the animals love to be the best versions of what they are given the right environment and their their environment is also the body in which they exist and the environment around uh, so yes absolutely all of that we do cover uh, you know and i focus a lot on that uh, i refuse to actually look at things in a very narrow myopic way right got it so you know coming to the next topic which you got, you, you i'm box completely specialized and you also specialize i got to know you more uh got to know you more uh, stuff you were doing when when i got to know you you were doing a lot of stuff around training behavior animal communication and uh myotherapy actually came later uh but yeah. uh, i would like to also you know talk about uh canine communication and how mm -hmm. over a period of time i have seen you uh you know going from a very a uh, basic level understanding to being a researcher now uh, and <laughs> and would like to understand you know how do you see dogs communicating with us i mean what are different what are different ways dogs actually communicate and you have done a lot of work on free range dogs right uh, yes. where in you yeah. you study uh, these dogs around us and please tell us yeah. uh, how do they communicate yeah. with us <clears throat> so uh dogs are incredible in how they communicate with us you know a lot of us when we talk about how do dogs communicate with us i ask my students uh, we talk about either them kind of barking or <clears throat> simple things right like um and they're wagging their tail and they're jumping on us and they're communicating with us but it's not it's really more than that right there's a lot more there that's happening uh they're a lot more in tune with what they uh what they're able to communicate with us if you just picture like if if you're tuning in from india you should be able to picture this really easily especially those of us from bangalore so <clears throat> if there's a bakery uh and uh, there are a bunch of people outside the bakery uh, and you they they used to be one near my house 4 o'clock in the evening all the uber drivers come there and they're having you know their chai and their smoke and they're standing there and invariably one dog turns up there right uh you can almost picture this and that dog what does he do he'll go around that entire group looking at all of the people trying to figure out which one which one do i need to go to here he will accurately pick the one that he needs to go to go up to that guy and say buy me a biscuit and that guy will promptly go and buy that biscuit and come why didn't he pick the other guy who is going to likely to kick him no he seems to know he seems to know which is the one who's not going to kick me not going to chase me not going to ignore me but actually give me the biscuit and um, you know it's for me when i see western literature on on animal communication um, i mean on on how dogs communicate <clears throat> they they still uh, are uh, they they seem fascinated that a dog can actually determine this and there are new studies that are coming out that are showing that you know dogs actually are able to determine friendly people fair people just by looking at them um and uh, to be able to actually tell them i want biscuit 
and if you go to that shopkeeper and ask him that guy will say oh that dog that dog doesn't like biscuit that dog likes cake you give this to him right so to be able to say all of this and if you look at street dog uh, people who take care of street dogs dogs are able to tell them um hey come and uh, help me because i am unwell come and help me because my friend is unwell uh, i have puppies that i need your help with come and they're able to say all this and that's really fascinating that they're able to say all this we don't have that level of studies done yet to say, say how are they saying all this so they are able to communicate a lot more than what we actually give them credit for and they are able to read us a lot better than what we give them credit for uh, most of us or it almost feels like sixth sense like how did my dog know this is happening but they are able to do that so well in terms of understanding what our intent is what we plan to do uh, and so trying to break that down and study it among street dogs um, this this has been a very fascinating thing for me because none of us get to train street dogs right uh, not that i didn't try training them <laughs> in my earlier younger stupider days i did it didn't work very well uh, and now i've learned to, i've learned to appreciate that and uh, really find it fascinating that you know we've been um, we've been doing a new set of studies uh, uh, on how they respond to our body language when we are trying to invite them to come to us and it's really interesting how they uh watch us so carefully a flick of an eye a flick of you know movement of a wrist the rotation of the body the way you kind of hold your body they read all that um they read that from a distance um <clears throat> i've been trying to try uh calling them with an angry angry face you know trying to make an angry face and seeing if they're interested in coming uh and what i realized is like an, an angry voice and what i realized is i was really struggling right as you can imagine i have a soft spot for these guys so i'm trying to say hey come here but my eyes are just uh, I, yeah. I'm, i'm smiling Hello. and they are able to see the difference to say okay you're pretending i hear your voice but i know you're not angry because your eyes say <laughs> something else it's yeah. fascinating that they're able to do those and read those and yeah. um you know i give i give this example to my students in class and i i love it it gives me goosebumps when i think about it so there is supposed to be a uh, uh, fossil evidence uh, that's 25000 years old i think uh, in a cave in somewhere in france mm-hmm. marseille if i'm not mistaken of mm-hmm. a boy walking in a cave with a dog seeing paintings on the wall that are 10000 years old so basically prehistoric museum and this guy 25000 years ago was walking there he was walking not running the dog was walking next to him not chasing him they stopped to change the light uh, the fuel in the lights so all of that has been captured in the fossil evidence so that means that and he was a boy which means that the adults of that community allowed him to be friends with this animal it wasn't uh, a wolf it was a dog so it's really fascinating that humans and dogs have been friends from at least 25000 years ago if so, not older yeah so earlier you know it was quite debatable but there is a new documentary on discovery called untold stories uh, about dogs and it actually yeah. says 30000 years and they give uh, all types yeah. of uh, but you know mm-hmm. that is uh, domestication or you know hunting together i'm not very sure but i think it is domestication only but uh, they are again and again in every episode they have said that it used to be 15000 or 10000 something like that but now it has been proven that it is 30000 so it is going beyond 25000 yes, and yes. Uh, yeah yeah and and they yeah. they are talking about evidence and then they are also talking were showing all types of skulls from the ethnology yeah. point of view right uh, so, so very interesting yeah so if some if an organism or, or you know if a, if if an animal is you know is only work is to build that relationship with human beings and they have been doing it for last 30000 years so they are pretty smart uh, at you know picking those gestures up uh, and then exactly. there was another one wherein they said that they actually know the your next expression uh, yeah. wherein you know they will uh, they will be able to um, uh i tell you that what are what are, what is going to be your next uh you know gesture or uh, because your expressions uh they come first on the right hand side of the face something like right. that right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. so very yeah. interesting but sindur what what fascinates me about the, uh, uh, about you is that you know when you actually tell 
these things like you know i've been telling these things watching these documentaries but what fascinates me is that you are actually doing these research right as as a as a part of your research group you are asking your students to go and collect these data sets and then you are arriving on uh, this thing i can you tell us more about it like how uh, what type of researches are you guys doing sure so we do it on two fronts one is of course what we do with free ranging dogs going and collecting data and coming back so we did one study on uh, the activity budget of dogs on how much time they spend doing different activities so what is a dog right what is uh, when we say a lot of people say a dog is a high energy animal a dog is running all the time is that really true what do dogs spend their time doing um these kind of uh, questions were answered in that and that was an oldish study um um <clears throat> and more recently now the new one that we have started is on the response to our body language uh, so we uh, hopefully that will be out soon and you know we can share the results and that'll be fun uh, the other way we do this uh, these studies is also uh, to study you know uh, patterns that we see in our pet dogs at home so as a part of um, uh, and again this is kind of crowdsourcing the information so each student uh, will be doing some amount of research on their own dogs and sending it back in and then eventually when we have a critical number then we will kind of see patterns and publish it um but we do a lot of different studies like we do uh pee studies sleep studies barking studies uh, we uh, we use body language to communicate with our dogs but it's one thing to say that they understand it and another thing to say that they we can prove it that they understand it so if you are asking our dog to say hey it's okay relax don't bark your head off uh, be calm uh, are they being calm is that making them calm uh, so can we can we actually put numbers down and you know you and i are engineers we love numbers so yeah. <laughs> uh, putting putting numbers down um uh, to saying uh, like i was talking to you you know the other day uh, when we talk about a dog that is barking his head off uh, the first th- thing is to determine why is the dog barking his head off um I, and like i mentioned to you there are different kinds of barks that dogs have uh, we have uh, my teacher toured documents upwards of seven different kinds of barks and one of them happens to be alert barking there is a problem outside please go deal with it uh so then what is the response what is the right body language response to give to this and like i told you what we found interesting is that if you give the right response the amount of barking both the duration and the number of times they bark is coming down so clearly there's something that's working there that the dogs are understanding and saying okay this works so those are the kind of studies that we do and the other is for example if you do a p study uh, to say to, we do believe that um, you know based on the stress levels and things like that the p patterns change in dogs so trying to put that down in numbers um, and uh, studying that is what we do of course the results i can't really tell you right now because we need critical mass on it and then we will sit and mine the data which uh i think it's only people like me who get excited at the idea of saying we will mine the data <laughs> but um <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> got it yeah that is very uh, you know coming from a tech technology company i think uh, we all talk about <laughs> big data analysis and stuff like that and when yeah, we yeah are i start uh, when you say data right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, some people ask me that how did I did do what I did like in on Dogport? Uh, how did you manage to get so many people coming to Dogport? It is India's number one website. So I said Google Analytics, and people, you know, keep wondering how can you get traffic from Google Analytics? And I, you know, <laughs> keep telling them all you need to do is read data, right? Go and <laughs> take, take a deep dive, do do some analysis, do some synthesis, you know, learn something. Is that Nishi? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> she, she's an old lady yeah. right she has her patterns right. this is the time when she has to come into the room so it doesn't matter okay. if the world is collapsing she needs to come into the room <laughs> oh okay <laughs> yeah they are very particular about this about their schedule as, i mean as there especially is especially at the age yeah yeah uh, yeah at the age as well as you know this is new thing which i learned that they can actually uh, do weekly clocks so oh, they would okay. know at yeah so that is that is something new there is a research which happened i think in some country in europe wherein there is a graveyard and people uh, come there on sundays to put some you know eating stuff and they uh, they give it to uh, people who are uh, who are under the, in the grave just as an offering uh, and then uh, these dogs they know exactly they come there in the evening of sunday every week 
to you know yeah. eat that stuff or uh, some dogs which are weaker they come on monday mornings to eat the leftovers <laughs> right so so they actually understand uh, they have a weekly clock system and which is very very amazing uh, okay so you know we there was one example sindur you gave uh, about you know barking and uh, mm-hmm. there were some ways the barking uh, was actually controlled and then the research actually said that yes it is in control or it has changed uh, can you yeah. tell us uh, more about yeah. that research? So that's, that's kind of what i spoke to you about uh, it was particularly alert barking that we were looking at and what we found interesting is that uh, if we could use body language uh, to uh, communicate with them when they're alerting is to say hey it's okay i got your point i understand uh and you know take care of this uh and what we were measuring was you know how long these dogs bark during the day if we give the body language versus if we don't give the body language there was also a pilot study done which is not in the public domain right now but it was done to actually measure their heart rate so we plan to do that as well uh to measure their heart rate to see if you know what happens when they start barking like this which you expect the heart rate to shoot up but then if we communicate with the body language uh to say it's okay calm down we saw that their heart rate was actually not spiking that much it was actually remaining relatively low uh, so that's fascinating when you tie the two together to say that you know when we communicate with them the right way we understand so if the dog is barking and saying there's a problem there <clears throat> many of us make the mistake of turning around and looking at the dog and yelling at the dog but he's saying there's a problem there because a dog fundamentally is an alerting animal that's his yeah. primary job so he's meeting that need to say okay there is a problem there this is my job i'm trying to tell you and if you're not going to understand this and process this then i might have to escalate into going into guard barking and yelling and taking care of the problem so stop being an idiot and take care of the problem so you know we need to stop being idiots right we need to say okay <laughs> i got it i see that's a problem there and that, i see the poor the poor dogs doing that which is to say stop looking at me there's a problem there and you need to look there <laughs> so you know starting with you know basic things like that just the direction in which we look at the kind of response we give to say okay okay i i hear you i went and saw and i'll take care of it i'll fortify the house i maybe i'll shut the door maybe i'll shut the curtains uh responses like that too you know including other kinds of body language responses uh can actually work pretty well for them and that's where communication steps and understanding of the dogs and communication steps in to say okay um uh this is what the dog is trying to say and if i really understand that he's not trying to annoy me that's not the end goal here he's trying to say there's a problem outside so i have to stop treating it as him trying to annoy me and turn around and asking him to shut up because then he is going to want to take charge here so instead if i understand and say okay i got your message and i went and looked and very good and this girl she she's an alerting girl you can see her right she's been checking the perimeter out so for yeah. her i have to actually uh i have to not only say okay i i dealt to the problem then i have to come back and tell, give her a prize and the prize can be as yeah. simple as i don't have it here but uh, a ribbon i put a ribbon on her neck wow cheeru you saved the house here to have a ribbon and then she walk around with this i have ribbon yeah. she'll go show it to nishi i have ribbon i i did my job <laughs> and i got ribbon <laughs> <laughs> nice. and the frequency yeah. of the barking all of that comes down you know if she sees a problem sometimes she doesn't even bark and she come running inside to say mama and you know then the barking isn't a problem anymore it's such a source of joy because i understand she's doing something that she thinks she needs to do i can reward her she feels good about it and our relationship improves and the same thing if you didn't come from a place where you understood it i would get angry with her saying my dog is a barking problem i'm yelling at her trying to fix it trying to change behavior hey it's just a downward spiral um so i think that's where you know these these numbers research numbers once we publish them i think it, it will it will really make a difference uh yeah, to how people also, look at it also i feel that you know once you start understanding these basics then your behavior with dogs completely change and then yeah. at the same time dogs also start behaving in a very different way so yeah. uh, you know i usually whenever they bark i stand up i give the importance to that bark you go and check out and then you come back and you will see over a period of time the bark can go less i mean you know they they start feeling that oh i barked but there is nothing uh, yeah. oh i'm sorry <laughs> 
right so so that expression <laughs> i have seen and then i have also seen that the barking goes uh, lower and lower and yeah. uh, it is never yeah. zero and which is good uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah. so uh, so so you've got two dogs right nishi and chiru yeah and uh, tell us about you know nishi's role in your life uh, just a little oh. bit i think i missed it in the beginning Uh, and uh, yeah. we should have started from there yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh nichi is the center of my life really center of my career the reason my career exists so i mean we got her when she when we were young and stupid and she was also young and cute <laughs> so we knew very little about it uh, but i think our lives took a very very short turn when um when nichi uh, met with an accident when she was 9 months old uh, basically a car ran over her face uh so you can't see any of that now uh, but um at that point it, it it she did lose an eye she lost sensation on her face her jaw broke uh, you know she has no mucus secretion so basically the right side of her face is quite damaged and then she also had a genetic issue in her leg patellar subluxation on the hind knee uh, unilateral so she had lots of surgeries that particular year her second year was just in and out of hospitals for a full year um and i think uh, what i realized i mean i didn't know much about dogs i'll admit uh, though i've had dogs all my life um in my grandparents house my parents house and all that uh, i didn't know enough about them uh, but when I, i knew at least enough to know that when a dog goes through this kind of trauma there is going to be uh, something like a post traumatic stress disorder right some they're going to have emotional issues they're not i've seen dogs go through far less trauma uh, come out being severe biting dogs at the end of it uh, so somebody who's a dog that's been through this i knew that we were in for something emotional and the vet were working hard on phys- fixing her physically but mentally what do we do uh, and uh, though i aspire to be a trainer and all that training is not going to fix an emotional issue i can't ask her to sit stay down and think that you know it's going to go away uh so <clears throat> what we did is uh, I, what i did is i started looking around furiously for some help and i found help from my teacher tour edrugas and so those of you who have not heard of her please look her up to t u r i d uh, r u g a a s tour edrugas uh she has a fantastic book on how to communicate with animals uh, how to communicate with dogs and how they communicate with us and uh, so talking to her i started uh, getting help on how to actually understand what was going on with my dog how, how, you know if i want to help her first i need to understand what's going on in her head right uh, if i want to help her emotionally i need to understand what her emotional state is so that uh, that journey that started there and tourid was wonderful in helping me and from there i went on to being able to help other dogs i went and spent a month in norway with tourid and her students and then subsequently i did uh, her a year long education in the us um and so as you can see uh, and then even my myotherapy course i started because nishi had the patellar subluxation in her leg so <clears throat> uh, uh pretty much all my qualifications my career all of that has been um, you know inspired by uh, nishi and um, so yeah <laughs> yeah very nice i mean we are- i know that story very very well and have uh, you know uh, because i've seen it over a period of years and what happened and been following it uh, and i've heard from you as well but i wanted uh, you know people who are uh, watching this to know uh, that how a dog can change your life uh, and uh, how impactful it can be and this is about the human and dog bond which is about 30000 years old yeah. and yeah. Uh, they are uh, amazing creatures uh, visa is appreciating me publicly which is very nice thank you visa <laughs> she always does but i am saying it just for the <laughs> that uh, i've been able to communicate better uh, communicate with our dst he was quite a you know guy on marking so we have been able to right. control him and visa yeah. also yeah. Uh, takes uh, a lot of care and part uh, in uh, fixing this guy so Uh, right. so that's that's what so we are going to uh, wanted to talk about you know bark and uh, mm-hmm. how uh, how is bark different than any other institute in india which is about dog training and behavior and uh, 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 and we'll talk about more subjects but you know one thing which i 
uh, wanted to understand is that is it the only institute in India or maybe Asia PAC which is into research of animal behaviors or there are many other institutes? Uh, I don't want to make tall claims that we are the only one I, because research often doesn't, um, uh, you know, people don't talk about research unless they publish studies. Uh, I know that uh, uh, in terms of an institute doing animal behavior research, we definitely are not the only one, not only in, not even in India. So IISP does animal behavior research. Uh, okay. IISCR Kolkata does specifically dog behavior research. Uh, so there's a place called the dog lab where they do, uh, but those are purely academic, right? They, it's large only, only to do with animal behavior research. Um, <clears throat> so I think we are, uh, what we do a little differently from them, um, they're pure sciences. Uh, we are also into looking at, uh, uh, behavior consulting. So it's not just ethological research. It's even behavior okay. consulting to improve the quality of life of our, uh, companion dogs. So companion dogs is not something they look at that much. Um, and, and of course, you know, we prepare our students for being consultants. Um, so if you want to actually be a behavior consultant, so I don't do behavior consulting anymore. I used to do that a few years ago. So it's kind of preparing people to do what I used to do, uh, which is, uh, if you, if you have pet dogs that have behavior problems, uh, they can bring those dogs to you. <laughs> Uh, they can bring uh, the dogs to you and you can look at their behavior and like I said, take a very, very holistic view of we, we do a one and a half hour interview before we say a word from our end, right? Uh, okay. You have sent us, we've seen videos that you've sent, we've seen pictures that you've sent, we've seen the medical records, we interview you, we grill you to understand every aspect of your life, your dog's life. And then we come out and say, okay, this is where we think here's an issue. This is what we think it is and this is what we need you need to be doing so that's what a behavior consultant does uh we're not we're not trainers i think that's one thing that's kind of different with us and what most other people do we don't do any training per se none at all uh, <clears throat> and that's that's again a transition i have had when i started with nishi uh, on a personal basis i was training her but we've gone a long way and there's no more training involved uh, so we largely come from uh, looking at a behavior and saying, instead of trying to make the behavior go away, uh, how do we put the dog in a different environment so that there is no need for that behavior anymore? Um, uh, and looking at things from that perspective and, and a lot of deep depth analysis, right? Uh, and that's why uh, Barks actually offers, uh, our, our main thing that we offer is we offer a, uh, a diploma, a 500 hour diploma, an accredited 500 hour diploma that we offer. Uh, and uh, 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 and the reason why it's a 500 hour diploma is that there is, we expect our students to have a much better understanding of the health of the dog, the body of the dog, the movement of the dog. I'll give you a really simple example and that's kind of mind blowing. So a lot of times people come and tell you, oh, my dog is chewing and destroying things. How do we fix this problem? Now, there are many training solutions to it. But a behaviorist approach would be to say, okay, we have to get to the bottom of this problem. There are many things that cause chewing. So stress causes chewing, excitement causes chewing. Some dogs, there's a lot of sensory input in this mouth area, there are a lot of nerve endings. So dogs like to pick up things in their mouth when they get stressed, much like we bite our nails or thumb sucking, right? So a similar trait. But what I learned even more recently is if they have stomach ulcers, they tend to have oral stereotypies. So if a dog is chewing things a lot, there is the possibility that the dog has a stomach ulcer. Uh, how do we oh, even okay. begin to guess that? Right? We don't even have proper endoscopy in India for the dogs, right? So that's really where we come from is to say, okay, if we're looking at uh, so-called problem behaviors, is there something else that's leading to it? Because a behavior, it's just behavior. A, a dog chewing something is part of a dog's ethogram. It's a natural behavior for a dog. If he's doing it excessively, there is something that's causing it. It's not just because he's bored. If he is bored, then we have to figure out why he is bored. So that's an issue we have to address. But more often than not, he's either stressed or too excited or there is an issue inside um, that we need to look at and address. And that's that's what behavior consulting is about. Um, and that's what we kind of offer at box. And then, of course, there is the whole research angle because we do believe that uh, we have to back a lot of what we do with science 
So our students are encouraged to do small mini research, and then at a larger level, I lead uh, some of the research right now. And hopefully, as we grow, we will have more students leading more research um, to publish in papers and stuff like that. So that's the aim. We're just starting out. Uh, hopefully, we will get there. So that I think that so, those are kind of the big differences in terms of content. Got it. And what what all uh, areas you cover? Do you also do some courses other than behavior and training, or uh, it is? We don't do training. Uh, behavior only. Behavior only. Sorry, behavior only. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we ourselves don't do anything else because I like the idea of sticking to core competencies, and mine is behavior and um, uh, and ethological research. So we stick to that. Having said that, though, we do have affiliates. Uh, we, I am a member of Pet Dog Trainers of Europe. I'm a country representative for Pet Dog Trainers of Europe. And they have a lot of interesting professionals offering many different kinds of things. So I got to know of Julia from that. Um, uh, Julia was in India. And we host their events here. So Julia was in India two years ago. And um, she's going to be back soon. So she, I think she will talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> And I think last year we had uh, Els from Belgium come down and we did something on sensory integration. Uh, this is something that actually is used uh, with the people with autism. They use sensory integration. So we use that for uh, dogs with hip issues and behavioral issues on how to improve sensory integration, how to meet those needs. Um, um, so the intent is uh, for us to actually work with our affiliates to see if we can get more courses in. Uh, of course, we can't fly anybody in for now, so we have to wait. Uh, but whatever we can do with our affiliates to uh, enable more learning for students. And then we also have, uh, we are also affiliates of um, ISCP, International School of Canine Psychology. So we have like deals with them, right? Um, if you go attend their course, you'll get a discount from our end. If you go attend the Garland course, you'll, go, you'll get a discount from our end. So it, it's a collaborative effort. So we ourselves, I myself do not teach anything out of my core competency, but I do get visiting faculty and we do have sort of uh, affiliations with other schools. Okay, so, uh, you know, when we go to your website, we see that there are two courses. One is Canine Essential 101, and then there is uh, Backpad, right? Yeah. Uh, and then you also said that uh, 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 the diploma course is an accredited course, right? So yes. what type of accreditations are we uh, right. talking about? I mean, uh, what type of uh, diploma a person gets when he completes and how easy or difficult is this course? Okay. Um, so the Canine Essential 101 is a, a workshop. It's a 15 hour workshop that we do currently online entirely, but live, not, not a set of videos that you're watching. It's live. I'm going to be okay. talking to you for all 15 hours. Clearly I can talk for a lot of, a lot of time. Uh, uh, the back bed is uh, Bach's Applied Canine Behavior and Ethology Diploma. That's back bed. That's our diploma. That's our accredited diploma. It's a 500-hour diploma that is self-paced. Uh, so students have up to three years to complete it. You can go ahead and do it. The fastest of our students are doing it about in a year and a half. Um, <clears throat> It was, and it is an accredited one. And what I mean by that is it's not me running to, you know, a printer or something and printing a certificate and giving it to you. That's not what it is. Uh, there is what we have is we have an external educational auditor. Uh, so we are accredited in the UK as a level four <coughs> UK diploma. Uh, our auditors are uh, 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 laser learning awards, same auditors that uh, the Garland guys have. Um, they are called an awarding body or an awarding organization. What they do is they have looked at every piece of our course content, made sure that we meet the standards of a level four UK diploma. Uh, then they have trained us. Uh, they've trained our internal quality managers. So we have an internal quality manager who does sampling and makes sure that uh, uh, you know the, the, the course that is being delivered is meeting a level four. Uh, it's meeting the standards required. We have an external quality assurance, so they will look at further sample this and make sure that we are doing things right. So it's like I mentioned to you, you know, this it's a lot of paperwork. It's our uh, lovely British bureaucracy <laughs> that we're very used to, and we have happily right. embraced. <laughs> uh, so it's all there. <laughs> um, it's a lot of paperwork, and it has cost us a lot of energy to actually do it. It wasn't easy with these guys. Uh, it, they were one of the hardest in terms of getting accredited, but. We wanted to do it because, as you're quite aware, this entire industry is unregulated. It's unregulated pretty much across the globe. 
So anybody right. can turn around and say, you know, you don't have to have learned anything and you can turn around and say, hey, I'm offering this diploma, I'm offering this thing, I'm offering this course and there's no questions asked. So where do our students go to find out, okay, is this legit and what does legit mean, right? So that's why we wanted to sort of put ourselves through the grinder and say, okay, we will expose ourselves to this kind of um, external uh, um, oversight um, so that we are delivering something of quality to you. Because if you're going to be uh, giving 500 hours of your life to my course, uh, then uh, you deserve to know that I'm doing my job right. Um, and that's, yeah. that's kind of, um, that's what accreditation is about. And you guys can go look up Laser Learning Awards. You'll see what they have to offer. Um, you, you'll see what they do. Uh, and the, you know, we that's where we use. So eventually your the students uh, um, certificate and transcript, they come from the UK. They come from them, not us. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Very nice. Yeah. This is yeah. very interesting. I think uh, this is a great step towards, uh, you know, some type of a regulation and industry. Uh, organized way of you know doing things uh, very very interesting so i also wanted to you know understand uh, we never discussed this question but while you know i am hearing it all over again talking to you uh, we were talking a few days back as well is that you know if somebody completes this diploma uh, mm -hmm. what are the career options what can that person do are there any further right. courses available uh, can they uh, what what are the career options like you know that's a very typical uh indian household question uh, yeah. that after doing this diploma what yeah. will you be doing yeah yeah and it's a fair yeah. question right because uh this it, it's a significant amount of time and effort investment and so it, it's absolutely a fair question to ask uh so first up the, this is a diploma for uh as i said two aspects behavior consulting and ethology so one career path straight away is doing behavior consulting and i think that's on the rise constantly in india uh, and we are enabling our students to be able to do behavior consulting online and things like that. So hopefully uh, our students market is not limited to India or even the city they live in, but uh, it's open to, you know, the entire world. And and uh, I do have enough confidence in my students to say that they'll probably offer a service that is uh, surpasses global standards. Uh, it's right up there, uh, you know. Uh, I, I'm a tough teacher, so I, I know that I prepared my students for it. <laughs> Good. Um, Good. Uh, so that's number one is behavior consulting. Um, and uh, that itself is uh, a fairly lucrative. Uh, I mean, a fairly, I shouldn't say lucrative, but uh, I think it's a, a fairly required um, uh, service. And with more and more people getting dogs, uh, more and more people getting dogs in urban households, uh, we see more and more issues. and. And I think this is necessary for uh, <clears throat> for helping them manage their households. Uh, the other uh, uh, field to go is ethology. So if there are, I do have a few students who like to get into the field of research. So that's the other thing, uh, part that will be opening up, which is to assist me and then start leading their own research as well. Mm, so we don't have anybody who is leading research right now, uh, but hopefully once they do complete, uh, you know, and, and I've, Kind of train them enough they will be able to do that uh, and the field of dog research as you can see so many new studies coming right it's like people are dying to know and uh, especially study on free-ranging dogs people it has really become very popular people so badly want to know about it um yeah. uh, to, to the extent where uh you know uh, I, like i mentioned to you dr mark beckoff published my research in his uh, i mean printed my about my research mentioned it in his book uh, canine confidential so uh, there is this renewed interest in understanding uh, what street dogs are like. And I want, I my, my dream is that we will kind of be able to give a lot of input to the rest of the world from India, from the core competency we have here. And then this the is third is. If, yeah, yeah, because, you know, uh, what you write. Yeah, yeah, complete yeah. it and then I'll yeah, come back. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in terms of uh, further education, uh, again, I told you that this is not a regulated industry. So there are no clear parts per se. Uh, but at the end of the day, you are getting a level four, UK level four diploma. And that is agnostic of university. So if there's any university out there who says that we will admit students who have done a level four diploma and we offer this, then you should be able to take a certificate there and say, oh. look, I've done this. Yeah. 
Uh, having said that, if there are specific universities that my students are going to be interested in, there are specific uh, institutions that my students are going to be interested in to say, Sindhur, I want to uh, study with them, uh, then we will probably open that uh, dialogue and say, uh, with that institution to say, okay, how do we actually make sure that there is a clear career path? Um, we are so early in what we're doing that uh, really the options are wide open. And because we've kind of uh, made sure that we're getting an accredited diploma, I think, uh, you know, a lot more options are open. It's just a matter of paving that thing more, a little bit more clearly. Right. I think uh, we lost you, Sindhur, uh, waiting for you to get back. For a I bit. can hear you. Yeah. yeah. OK, cool. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe okay. it was at my end, yeah. So yeah, so so you know what what I was I was uh, trying to say, Sindhur, at that point in time is that you are going to be producing some of the global behaviorist out of India, right? So that is what uh, we are trying to do, and yep. that's why the course is of global level and the accreditation is yeah. uh, from UK. And uh, there is an interesting uh, question. I'll just take one or two questions. There is one uh, question from Visa as well. We will take it before we sign off. Uh, uh, so, Shantni, uh, before that, you know, I would like to say all your students are agreeing that you are a strict teacher. So, everybody said, yes, you are. We know. <laughs> Yay. <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, Sushmita and Kalyani are, uh, you know, they cannot agree more, I think. <laughs> so, in your website, it is said that only students who have done Canine Essential yeah. 101 can apply for back uh, just wanted yeah. to know if one of the canine foundation course would one is still have to do the canine essential yeah. foundation oh they will have to yes. do right okay yes they will because uh, we don't do training actually so what we cover in canine essential 101 is not training we are actually doing the foundation of uh, the kind of communication that i was talking to you about earlier um, body language communication, lifestyle issues, and how the you know the the body is connected to the mind and things like that. So it's the foundation for the way we do things and our approach. It's uh, significantly different from training. So yeah, you will have to repeat it. Okay. So we have a good point. Uh, you know, Ruhi has made. She says that behavioral consulting has become more important during the time of lockdown. Yes, and uh, that builds more career options probably in the days to come because people are spending more time with their pets. Uh, Weasel is saying, can you share three basic tips with every pet owner, mm -hmm. should, which every pet owner should follow to understand their dog better and which will help them in communication okay. with them? So yes, anything very basic, like three things, it would be nice. OK, uh, so if I were to pick to three away. things, uh, I'll probably say, number one, um, learn about calming signals. That's the way dogs communicate with us. And if we can understand what they're saying to us, your quality of life, your dog improves significantly. So there is a lovely book by Ture Drugas called On Talking Terms with Dogs. You can do that. Or uh, I have a TEDx talk on, um, on, on this topic. So you can search for Sindhu TEDx and you will find, find the talk. Or uh, on, uh, on uh, Wikipedia, you'll find information about coming signals. So learn about them. Learn to read it. Uh, that's that's number one. Number two is learn to observe your dog before actually trying to do, do, do. Uh, instead, take time to observe your dog. Observe what, what you're seeing and just <laughs> and try to make sense of uh, it. No, don't rush into conclusions. Don't try to, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit putting the cart before the horse. So just try to uh, make it a habit. Turid has this uh, way of saying, uh, uh, you know, she's very popular for saying, shut up and observe. Observe, observe, observe. And I think any person who's good with animals, you'll see that they're very astute observers. So observe. And three is maybe develop a better understanding of the body of the dog uh, in terms of health, in terms of looking for signs of pain and things like that. Try to um, pay attention to that and, uh, uh, you know, lifestyle issues and things like that. Pay attention to that. Uh, if, if you make important lifestyle changes, sometimes you don't need anything else with your dog. Your dog will cook. You know, you don't need training. You don't need anything fancy. It will be wonderful. So pay attention to and try to learn about lifestyle changes that can help your dog. Um, and that would be my three big tips. 
Great. Thank you, Sindhur. Uh, it was great chatting with you. Uh, anything uh, you want to add more? I think we covered almost everything. Uh, I don't think I missed anything. Uh, oh, uh, one thing is coming to my mind. Uh -huh. uh, you visited our office uh, once upon a time, like about, I think, five, ten years back. And uh, we actually spoke about setting up a institute where there can be courses which are accredited. <laughs> and I remember that chat. And uh, to okay. see that happening, <laughs> uh, to see that happening is amazing. Uh, and uh, you know, it's like uh, what we actually imagine at one point in time, which looks so big, right? And whether we will be able to do it or not do it, and uh, you know, what does it take uh, to uh, build something like this, right? All those things we have seen over last uh, you know few years. So this is uh, very commendable. Uh, applauds to you what you are doing. Uh, for the whole industry as well as uh, for uh, uh, pets and dogs in general uh, and i'm sure uh, this is going to help uh, improve lives of humans uh, pets as well as uh, it is going to reduce a uh, lot of human and animal conflict uh, so i think uh, that is where we are headed uh, you were saying yeah. something, Sindhur, before I started uh, saying this, yeah. Oh, nothing. I was just saying, don't throw the ball in my court without an agenda. As you know, I can talk <laughs> till, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool, good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Sindhur. Thank you very much for my taking pleasure. time. My pleasure. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah Bye-bye, everyone. You Thank you, everyone, for being with my Bye. viewers and asking questions, sharing us up, your students. Uh, actually came back and then they said that uh, we like her, we love her, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Sushmita actually went ahead and said that, but we won't have it uh, any other way, right? So they would not have done it any other way. So cool. All right, thank you, Sindhur. Yeah, have a all right. Nice evening and all the best. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>